Now, this is a typical... But before we go into an art, I think we should do power and control. Before? Yeah, I think so. <coughs> because it makes more sense, you know, to do it that way. Okay. Um, we're going <laughs> to... If you okay. want to give an example of power and control. Well, yeah. In terms of... Uh, it well, maybe illustrate the thing we're going to dramatize better. Yeah, that's kind of what I had in mind. All right. All right. And, you know, and, you know, in the process of doing this, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. And, uh, you know, as you get to know me in this context we're in, you'll come to realize, if you already haven't, that some of my questions are setups, and they are. <laughs> <laughs> and so I would like to ask you, how many of you value emotional openness as a value? Just viscerally, what's your first reaction when you hear it? Doesn't it feel positive? Yeah. That's what we're trying to get at. Right, right, right. right. And how many of you, so, and now I'm going to ask you another question. How many of you, you know, really do feel that people shouldn't control each other? Don't want to be called controlling. Yeah, I don't know. Right. Visceral. Uh, visceral. Or, or, <laughs> okay. And, you know, and the reason that I put these two in tandem is that if you happen to have these two values uh, uh, juxtaposed with each other, you know, connected to each other, there's a great likelihood that you're going to drive yourself insane. <laughs> <laughs> and I would like to explain to you as best I can why that's the case. Okay, you know, what does emotional openness really mean? When you're emotionally open, what it really means is that you can be affected by. Hmm? So that if you're emotionally open to your children, how they feel affects you. If they're not feeling so good, it's harder for you to feel good. Uh, you know, if they're feeling really bad, it's really hard to feel good, you know, if you're emotionally open to them. And if they're feeling joyous, that has its carryover to you, too. So that to be emotionally open is to be affected by, you know, to whatever, you know, to whatever extent it is. And that if one looks very honestly at how we work, one of the prime interests that human beings have is how they feel, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, this just seems, you know, almost patently self-evident, basically, all right? And if you're emotionally open to someone, they can affect how you feel, right? Right, now, as soon as somebody can affect how you feel, there is something that happens. All of a sudden, you have a real vested interest. A preference. Uh, a preference in how they operate toward you. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and how they treat you. And, and also toward themselves. And, and you know, toward themselves, toward themselves. Right. You know, things like that. You want to change that. Right. So to, you know, them. so to the degree that somebody can af affect how you feel, you have an interest in how they act. Or, in other words, you'd rather they did things that made you feel good than bad, <laughs> basically. And made themselves feel uh, or good. Or made themselves feel good or bad. And here, in a very, very subtle way, are where the tendrils of control begin to come in, you see. Uh, you know, the ways control begins to play in these domains, you know, from the get-go, from, you know, from when the child is born. Uh, you know, it's like, you know, parents want children that are going to make them feel good and, uh, instead of bad. And in order to do that, generally, a parent feels better if they can inculcate the same values that they have into the child because this makes the communication and it makes the connection a lot easier. And, of course, the parent controls how these values are put into the child. But please understand, I'm not saying this is right or wrong. I'm just, you know, looking at how it works. So, you know, that from our perspective, we are controlling animals. We control our environment. You know, we have thermostats that... You know, uh, you know, we like soft beds, and, uh, you know, we don't want to be bothered too much. 
you know, if that is at all possible and we try to control that and we try to an extent control those around us that have a really visceral effect on how we feel. It, you know, to be aware of that, to be, you know, instead of saying this is good or bad or it should or shouldn't be, to be aware of how it works, how, you know, we play with this because, you see, the thing that we feel is that what is necessary for any kind of viable transformation is more awareness, you know, more real awareness in terms of how we work and what we do and what got us here and how we can get out of it, in, you know, in one sense or other. And, you know, so control... What, what was the Gestalt prayer in the 60s? <laughs> yes, Pearl? yeah. You know, I was a resident teacher at Esalen when, uh, you know, Fritz Perls was there. Have any of you heard of him? Uh, anyway, Fritz, uh, you know, Fritz, uh, you know, did what was called the Gestalt prayer. And I don't know if you're familiar with that or not. The, you know, the Gestalt prayer went something like this. The articulation isn't exact. It was like, you do your thing and I do my thing. And if we happen to meet, it's wonderful. And if we don't meet, we go our own way. And uh, many people in the 60s tried that out for size, finding that it was not a good context for making <laughs> relationships work, basically. <laughs> you, know, in, in, you know, in one sense or other. And, you know, and that we do intertwine. And in this intertwining, there is a, a, you know, an intertwining of boundaries that tighten and loosen you know, controls that loosen and tighten. And, you know, and the question is how to be aware of them and how not to villainize them, but how to really see how they work and how one can make them work for you instead of against you, you know, in one way or another is the really big issue. Because as Diana has said, the things that break people apart, and now we're getting into the... Uh, microcosm of, you know, personal relationships are, real, are really power and control issues, you know, when you really so, take a look at it. So before the 50s, mm -hmm. before the 50s, families were pretty structured with roles, of sex roles, and um, if you have an affair, you're cheating, you live up to your contract. It was fairly structured and controlling, the typical family. So that's why the 60s were breaking free, breaking out of control. Just like Ayn Rand uh, was, oh, self, self, uh, selfishness, is, selfishness, uh, self-centeredness is good, not bad. But it was sort of an at, uh, opposite reaction, a reaction against the old controls. We're not advocating either of those. <coughs> we're not saying the reactiveness, doing the opposite is good. In fact, he was showing you the problems with just total freedom. It didn't work. <coughs> but the question is, we feel, okay, control is always going to be part of intimate relationships and social relationships because you want to have some kind of effect and you have preferences on people that you're relating to in your neighborhood and your home. So the question is, how do you deal with control awarely and how, how could it even be fun? How could it be a source of evolution? Well, if you have the old frameworks that we've been talking about, of unconditional love and selflessness, those are anti-control frameworks where control is bad. If you think control is bad, then you don't look at where you're trying to control someone and you make them feel guilty if you see them trying to control you. All, all of this is not very productive. It's not a way of dealing awarely with feedbacks around this issue. And so we're trying to say, look, if control is part of human relationship, it can't be a bad, bad guy. It can't be villainized. That's self-defeating. You have to have it as a, a variable that you're dealing with intelligently, creatively, honestly. It has, a, it has its functions. 